in terms of finance, you know, that's really where I started after uh, the MBA. And really it was on, on the consumer side, uh, credit cards, uh, consumer finance, um, things like that. Who is this lady and what is she doing on Mountain Meister? That might be what some of you are thinking, but stay patient. There's a lot we can learn here. Look, you know, it's, you can't ignore everything you've learned as you try new things. These are your kind of uh, banked, if you will, bag of tricks. This is your experience, your knowledge, um, everything that you've accomplished in your life up till then. All of those and it seems like it's worked out pretty well for her. Climbing uh, Shishapang, Machoyoyu, and Everest. So there are 14 8,000 meter peaks or peaks over 26,000 feet. They're all in the Himalayas. They all border Nepal, Tibet, and Pakistan. So having done three of those at that time, every time I was on an- All of that in the best party. Yes, party that climbing has to offer. This is Mountain Meister. Who are the Mountain Meisters? Committing to the goal and galvanizing you and your team behind that one single focus. Being at peace with that fear and being okay with it. You gain a real appreciation for your life and for what you have. Learn about their extreme lives on rock, snow, and ice with your host, Ben Shank. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Mountain Meister. I am Ben Shank, your host, and today we welcome to Mountain Meister Vanessa O'Brien. Vanessa, welcome and congratulations. Oh, thank you, Ben. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's quite an honor to be named a Mountain Meister. You're in some pretty good company. You deserve to be there. Vanessa is the fastest woman to climb all seven summits, which Vanessa did in 10 months. And then she quickly ran over to the North Pole after that to complete the Explorer's Grand Slam, which is the seven summits plus the North Pole and South Pole. Vanessa, you did that in 11 months. Wow. Yep, that's right. (laughs) One Practically a year living in a tent or on the poles or something like that. So it was quite an experience. A year of your life. Wow. And I just found out you live in Boston, which makes me so pumped. As our listeners know, I live in Boston. How do you train for these things when you live in Boston? Well, you know, what I found is the best way to train is really to kind of uh, simulate what you're doing. So climbing. Um the thing is with, with traditional gyms, whether they're commercial gyms like Equinox or private ones, is, is the machines always take part of that momentum away from, you know, what, what you're doing. Mm-hmm. So the best way I found to prepare for a mountain is really uh, to climb staircases. And, you know, the trick there is if you're an urban dweller is, and you don't have access to the mountains like I don't in Boston, it's, it's at least a, a two and a half, three hour drive to the White Mountains, for example, you know, another the same, maybe further for the Adirondacks. Mm-hmm. So I have to train in the city. Um, what I did was I tried to find the tallest buildings I could and convince them to let me have access to the staircases. <laughs> really? Yeah. And, you know, I was immediately turned down by John Hancock. I was just going to ask about Hancock. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the point is, is in today's day and age, everybody's so security conscious that nobody wants somebody in that that doesn't have security clearance or that doesn't work in the building or anything like that. So I was I was turned down kind of straight away. So so the Hancock sixty floors, I think. Uh, so you turned down from the tallest building in Boston. What'd you end up going with? Yeah. So so uh, the Boston College Club um, happened to have the fiftieth floor of uh, a building over on Franklin Street down in the Financial Center, mm-hmm. and they were renewing their contract that 50th floor. And as part of that renewal, they, they actually leveraged me in there and said, yeah, but one of our members needs the staircase. And it was, it was so clever. And I love them to bits for this because, you know, at the end of the day, what ended up happening is um, it's, it's a, it was a Bank of America building. So security was just as tight there as anywhere else. Um, but they, they did it. They, they got me in and, um, you know, literally I would, I would go, you know, probably four times a week uh, do that staircase. It was 900 uh, sets of stairs um, over and over and over and over again. And even the security team, you know, called themselves base camp, which was adorable. <laughs> um, you know, and they'd give me like this walkie talkie and say, okay, you know, just uh, let us know how you're doing. And if I took a couple of hours, they'd start to get worried about me. Where was I? Because there's, 
There's no cameras in staircases. And in addition, they don't heat or cool the staircase because it's a, you know, kind of a waste of money. So depending on the season, you know, I, I almost have to be dressed for the staircase as I would be dressed to go outside. You didn't hook them up with one of those really high tech walkie talkies where they can spot you and find your GPS no. just to make sure you're OK. <laughs> no. In fact, the manager came down one time and said, look, you know, we need to know she's OK. Like, who's going to go find her? And they're like, well, I'm not going to go find her. There's 900, stair- <laughs> you know, 900 flights. I don't know, where, you know, because that's like physical effort. And they were like totally not up for that. But it was it was uh, good fun, and you know even this last mountain that I did, um, going back to the Himalayas for Manaslu, um, I ended up in a, another building on Franklin Street with the University of Mass Club. So it was the university clubs that really were my friends here to get access to those staircases. That's excellent. So quickly, just a little bit more on your background. You did uh, you spent a lot of time in finance, and I actually graduated with a degree in finance, uh, Vanessa. And I realized that if I wouldn't have left my job in finance and you wouldn't have left your career in finance to pursue this exploration, you at one point may have been my boss. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope I would have been a good boss. <laughs> I hope so, too. Now I'm hosting a wonderful conversation with you. So so you spent time at Bank of America, Barclays, Morgan Stanley, Capital. What, what were you doing for all these banks? Uh, you know, traditionally, I, I've uh, received my MBA through the Stern School of Business at New York University. So that uh, that really took me to uh, London, um, where I worked for Morgan Stanley. And I spent almost 12 years in London. Hmm. So um, through that time, I, I now have a British passport as well as an American passport. What about uh, an accent? No, you know, I, I say funny words. I'll say like boot if I'm not thinking to get something out of the trunk <laughs> uh-huh. or you know, full stop if I'm trying to accentuate the end of a sentence or cheers or stuff like that. I'll have a little, you know, kind of language thing, but it's always with an American accent. Uh. <laughs> um, and it's funny because my husband is British and, and, you know, the one thing he can't stand me saying is bloody hell. He's like, when an American says that, it just doesn't sound right. <laughs> you know, you can't say bloody hell and, yeah. and, like, and mean it the way a Brit can mean it. So I, I've been uh, banned from saying that one, but... <laughs> But everything else, you know, I, I do throw in a few British words. But um, so Britain is really, you know, home for me as as much as the U.S. And you know, in terms of in terms of finance, you know, that's really where I started after uh, the MBA. And really, it was on on the consumer side, uh, credit cards, uh, consumer finance, um, things like that. Really good fun, really good run. I think what 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 ended it for me was uh, that global recession in 2010, mm-hmm. and that's kind of. Uh, you know, the banks weren't willing to take risks. You know, it's kind of no fun being in this game if you don't take risks. I, I started off sort of as a finance director, CFO type, and then moved to business development. So when your counterparties and your own banks aren't taking risks, there's really nothing much to do. It's business as usual. That's not me. I'm a growth person. So if a business isn't growing, I'm, I'm not your girl. So you uh, decided since the banks weren't willing to pursue risks, you were just going to go out and climb the highest mountains in the world. Yeah, you know, it didn't start off that way. It started with a, a move to Hong Kong, okay. funny enough, for mm-hmm. three years. And I was looking for something to do that was kind of goal-oriented, um, that would take plus or minus three years. That's how long I thought the recession was going to last. And something that I could measure success. And, you know, I, I kind of had this criteria out there, and I, I was talking to different people about different things. And it was it was actually a girlfriend over lunch that said, what about Everest? And... We laughed. I mean, we laughed incredibly hard. It was <laughs> such a ridiculous idea. Um, you know, I had no climbing experience. I had previously climbed Kilimanjaro, but that was, you know, um, with, you know, it's not with alpine tools. You know, that's, um, that's trekking. And what you do learn there and why Kilimanjaro is great is it's 19,340 feet. So that does give you an experience at high altitude. But the Everest thing came because I was looking for something that would take plus or minus three years, and I figured it would take me at least two years to train for Everest. Mm -hmm. Um, But I did. After that, uh, I couldn't get it out of my head. I kept thinking about it, and before I knew it, I was off in New Zealand, um, you know, learning how to alpine mountaineer. Wow. So cool. So, I mean, let's be honest here. These things aren't cheap. You decided to quit your job at the peak of the recession and then go do something that costs money. Uh, Were you sponsored here, or were you supporting yourself? How How did this work? No, you know, it's, it, I, I, 
uh, let me take that in two parts. One is the move to Hong Kong, interestingly enough, um, Britain had raised tax rates to about 55 percent. Wow. So it was it was becoming a little bit more socialist and a lot of people on the dole and stuff like that, you know, on, on um, assistance. So part of the move to Hong Kong is is where they tax income at one, five, 15 percent. Hmm. So that was 85 percent, you know, really coming you know, into the house paycheck. So my husband and I could both work and give 55% to the UK government, or we could go to Hong Kong, get 85% off one salary. Yeah. So, so really it was a financial savings that allowed me not to work in the first place. And then when I wanted to do something different, it had to not be financial because if it was financial, I was competing with my former self, where I left off, where I was going, you know, career track, all of that. So it really had to be something different. Um, which is why the Everest thing was so just completely out of the ordinary, but fit every one of those criteria I was looking for. And Everest was happening now. You know, sure, it had happened then in 53 when Hillary and, and Tenzing, you know, climbed to the top, and it happened in 63 with the American team. But it was also happening now. The commercial expeditions were happening, you know, in our lifetime. So now in terms of, you know, since Everest initially was my only goal, uh, you know, it was about – Okay, fine. This is going to cost, you know, 75,000 plus or minus. Mm-hmm. You know, I had banked probably enough in terms of savings and from bonuses and things where I knew I could write that check. And in terms of sponsorship, I never thought about it in the first mountain because I knew I didn't have enough m- mountaineering experience and people weren't going to see me as a credible athlete. Later, after doing, say, the seven summits and, and, um, You know, as I was approaching my last trip for the polls, I actually did look for a sponsor, but I never had a lot of time. Sponsors need time, like six months, you know, Mm -hmm. or more. And, you know, I just went to people that I had relationships with or knew, and there just wasn't enough time to get it to work internally. Yeah. You know, like hearing you say this, and, and you mentioned that the sponsors were maybe worried that you weren't experienced enough, and we always hear from the mountaineering community that there are people out there and, you know, we read books like Into Thin Air, that there may be people who aren't experienced enough to be out there and hold their own, but they have the the money to do so. But you obviously proved that this was not the case with you after completing all of this. But at the same time, you weren't this lifetime climber. You were pretty fresh to the sport. Were you ever nervous that you weren't going to be experienced enough or people were going to perceive you that way? Uh, oh, definitely. They they perceive me that way. Um, I think that definitely the more experience you have, the more you know. It's as simple as that. And the experience can't be read. It can't be researched. It, mm-hmm. You know, it really has to be experienced. So when I – just a, a short snippet on that. When I, when I first got the mountaineering experience, I thought, okay, where should I apply these newfound skills? And I thought, well, the goal is Everest. Why don't I go to Everest? Not to the summit. I wasn't that mm-hmm. – um, completely mad. But I thought, okay, they sell these trips to Everest camp, you know, summit camp two or base camp. And I thought, well, the summit I'm not qualified for. Base camp, I'm probably overqualified for because I've been at 19,000 feet, base camp 17,500. So I had been higher in just trekking boots. Yeah. So camp two sounded good. And my rationale was sound, except I missed something called the Kumbu Icefall, which happens right out of base camp. So when I went to Everest to Camp 2 uh, in 2010, uh, I had absolutely failed to meet my goal. And that was a huge learning experience for me because I realized that everything I was researching, all the DVDs, all the uh, history, all the geography, all of this stuff was irrelevant. I needed to know about my body. I needed to know about acclimatization. I needed to understand the higher you climb, the lower the atmospheric pressure, what that does with this, in, you know, thin air, which is, you know, simply the lower atmospheric pressure, which is causing those um, oxygen molecules to disperse higher up. So when you take a breath in, you get less of them. The actual percentage of oxygen, by the way, doesn't change whether you're at sea level or at the top of Everest. Oh, wow. We might need to touch on that a little bit because I didn't know that. Yeah, so so a lot of people think, oh, into thin air, so there's less oxygen. No, oxygen is is the same. You know, the, it's the same 20- composition, like nitrogen, same. oxygen, it's, CO two, whatever. Yeah, that doesn't change no matter where you are. What changes is the atmospheric pressure that's decreasing mm-hmm. the higher you climb. And what that's doing, the best way to to visualize that is to the higher you go, these oxygen molecules are getting spread out further and further apart. 
instead of being close together. So when you take that breath, you're, you're getting less of those oxygen molecules. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's the best way, I think, to simplify it. But I needed to understand the, the science, the chemistry, all of that, because you know, I my first trip in 2010, I had pulmonary edema. Mm-hmm. You know, I had water in the lungs. I was coughing up the frothy, you know, kind of blood. You know, um, it was it was more than the kumbu cough for sure. Plus, I had been in an avalanche in the ice ball, which caused shock and hypoxia. So fingernails, lips were blue, all that stuff. So that was a great lesson for me because I went back and and I learned what I needed to do. And I consulted with real experts like Dr. Peter Hackett, who's over in Colorado at the Institute for High Altitude Medicine, um, who's probably one of our renowned experts in high altitude, um, you know, taking a look at my my composition, my uh, blood count, all of that. And then also just really trying to understand the science of it and, and training differently because, you know, the one thing a high altitude climb demands of you is um, – When air is a limited resource, your brain and your lungs must have it. Mm. That means muscle competes with it. So if you're going at high altitude, you know, carrying around these, you know, 60 pound packs and training like that is, is the wrong answer. Muscle is going to compete with that limited resource of oxygen. You need just enough strength to carry your minimum amount of weight, which is probably an oxygen bottle and masks and water, you know, and, and that's it. So you're talking about, you know, 20 pounds, something like this, 25 pounds. Um, you, you know, th- those big packs, those big, big packs work for um, expeditions that involve pulling sleds. Uh, you do that in Denali. You do that on both poles. You do it on Vincent. Then you want the endurance. You want endurance. You want, you know, you want to be strong. You want to have, you know, nice, nice, strong body, strong core, strong legs, all of that stuff. But high altitude is, is a different animal. So, so eventually you, you figure it out after the failure up to Camp 2. On your second attempt, is that when you were able to summit Everest? Yeah, so what I did was I went back to Choyoyu and said, I need to go to this high altitude. Mm-hmm. And in fact, in 2011 with uh, IMG, we ended up doing Shishapangma and Choyoyu back-to-back with summits eight days apart. Well, that, well, that will give you some good high altitude um, experience. Uh, you know what? And that's why when I went to Everest in 2012, I was ready. I knew all about it. I, I was, you know, kind of my subject matter expert. And funny enough, of, of my Everest team, the summit team in 2012, you know, by that time, this was my third 8,000 meter peak. And nobody had been higher than Denali, mm. you know, which is 20,237 um, feet. And, you know, th- there's a whole nother 10,000 feet, right? You're almost shy of 30,000 for Everest. Mm-hmm. So I, I had done the least amount of mountains, but all of the mountains I had done had been higher at high altitude. Quality over quantity, right? <laughs> I'd like to put it that way, sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I noticed that you use a lot of business terminology when you're describing the mountains. I like your sub- subject matter expert there, your SME. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. No, you know, I mean, because look, you know, it's, you can't ignore everything you've learned as you try new things. These are your kind of uh, banked, if you will, bag of tricks. This is your experience, your knowledge, um, everything that you've accomplished in your life up till then. All of those experiences are going to follow you whatever you do. I love that quote there. I, I, I've grown very fond of quotes just in general. And I take a quote out of every episode of Vanessa. I think you just said it right there. You said that you can't forget everything you've learned when you try new things. That's awesome. Oh, totally. <laughs> uh, so so you do Everest and you do the other six highest peaks in each of the remaining six continents. Then you go down to the South Pole. When you finished, when you finally finished all of this, North Pole, you're done. How do you feel? Um, you know, it, it was it was awesome. Each of those things, though, happened kind of in a funny way because it was really climbing – Climbing uh, Shishapangma, Choyoyu, and Everest. So there are 14 8,000 meter peaks or peaks over 26,000 feet. They're all in the Himalayas. They all border Nepal, Tibet, and Pakistan. Um, those are the big boys where you really get high altitude. Mm-hmm. And, and these, so having done uh, three of those at that time, every time I was on an expedition, you know, the climbers were talking about different things. So I learned from other climbers that there was this thing called the Seven Summits. Mm-hmm. And I learned from other climbers that there was this thing called the Explorer's Grand Slam. So these weren't known terms to me. These were wow. things that, that I found out by climbing with other people. So what happened is, is when Everest was finished, 
I kept thinking, okay, well, now I'm sitting here in May. Uh, this is, is it, this isn't really a great time to, to, to go back to work or do something, you know. It's the summer. Come on, you got to take the summer off, right? Yeah, well, you know, so I'm like, well, what am I going to do to kind of kill a little bit more time? And then as it happens, these mountains all have seasons. Mm-hmm. So right after Everest, boom, what do you got? You got, uh, you know, Mount McKinley, Denali. That's immediately following Everest. And, you know, you can leverage a little bit of that acclimatization, which lasts maybe, you know, four or five weeks, six weeks, if you're lucky, where you've got those red blood cells still kind of pumping through your veins. That, um, you know, that will help you uh, go to another mountain. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I did that, you know, right away. I was like, fine, I'll I'll do Denali. And then it was like, wow, there's another season, another season. And they all kind of just back, back to back with each other. I guess my second goal was the Seven Summits, having heard about it on the trail. And then I just proceeded with that. And where the Explorer's Grand Slam comes in is you feel like, okay, one of the seven summits is Antarctica, right? It's a mm-hmm. continent. It holds a mountain. The interesting thing is you're now on Antarctica. It's like, what's in Antarctica? Well, the South Pole. So if, and it's hard to get to Antarctica. You know, this is not an easy place. You're, yeah. you're right smack at the bottom of the world. So you almost feel like, shouldn't I leverage my trip there while you're there you might as well right because otherwise i mean you're, you're spending a whole nother you know 40 grand or something to get down there mm-hmm. and you know if you're already down there you're, you're just leveraging ale who's a logistic provider who can you know sort out the trip to the last degree or something like that so that's how the explorers grand slam started coming in is is really leveraging where i was to say hey you know i'll probably never be here again are you are you never going to go there again um, I don't know. I love Antarctica. You know, I've been doing some work with um, uh, the, the American Alpine Club and the Explorers Club here in New York. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, really, there's there's been a lot of a lot of recent uh, firsts around polar travel. So I continue to stay plugged in with the polar side as much as I do on the mountain side. T- TBD um, is another uh, business oh, term. How's that? Love it. Love it. <laughs> and then what about what about finance? Do you ever see yourself going back to finance? You know, I'm, I'm not opposed to um to really anything in the future, but I, the one thing the mountain has has taught me, um, besides patience, which was a hard thing to learn, mm-hmm. was um, that I probably couldn't put up with the same level of bureaucracy mm-hmm. and politics that I used to put up with. So I would have to work with with a really kind of um, forward looking, growing, um, you know, kind of a, a, a nice team that was really focused on you know, a common goal of, of trying to build a bank or build, build a customer base or do something or and whatever it is, it doesn't have to be a bank, but who I work with and, and, you know, what the, what the goal is, mm-hmm. is probably more important because I just couldn't sit in a large institution, uh, having meetings all day and getting nothing done. Yeah. And I think when you do something so intensive, that almost becomes the standard. Well, not, maybe not the standard, but at least in comparison, that thing that you were doing before, becomes a little less significant and I guess it leaves you wanting more. Yeah. And I think, you know, it, it might also come to do with just experience too. The more you're experienced, the more you've, you, you yourself have experienced, yeah. like, you know, you get to that point where life's too short. I, I just don't want to spend it contributing to, to something that's not going anywhere. Hmm. Good point. So uh, we like to get a gear recommendation from all of our guests on this show, Vanessa, and I, I say sometimes we don't always talk about gear on this show, but when we do, we prefer that it comes from someone who did the Seven Summits and explores Grand Slam faster than any other woman <laughs> in history. <laughs> Give us some gear that our listeners have to have. Well, you know, um, if you're if you're in somewhere cold um, or high. Um, chances are weather's not going to be in your favor. So, you know, somewhere like the top of Everest, you'll have, you know, 45 mile an hour winds. It'll be 40 below. Is that Celsius or Fahrenheit? 40 below is parity, so don't worry about that. But it's cold. And, you know, what what you don't want to take shortcuts on is um, not having – you know, kind of the right summit suit and places like that. So, and this is true for sleeping bags as well. Now, Feathered Friends is an interesting company. This is out of Seattle. Um, they they actually make their own quality summit suits and sleeping bags. And I think you want to get those things right mm. because you don't want to be caught out um, where you're too cold or you're, you don't have the right um, equipment. Almost everything these days you can use down. You can use down on mountains. You can use down on 
the South Pole. You cannot use down, by the way, on the North Pole. It's Why too, is that? Uh, it's, it's, it's too wet. It's, oh, it's okay. wet cold. You know, on, and the North Pole is on ice. It's not on land in the, in the Arctic mm-hmm. Circle. So you, you cannot use down there. It's just once down gets wet, it, it doesn't dry. And that um, the air has so much humidity in it that um, you're in two states, either frozen or wet. Oh, God. That uh, sounds so, miserable. Oh, it's, it is miserable, but you know, no down there. So it all has to be synthetic. And by the way, all the companies today make equivalent equipment in synthetic and down. So, he, so here really quickly is this really stupid question. But so down normally comes from animals, right? It's the, the feathers that are underneath the guard feathers. I think that's what I read when I was looking at a pillow one time. But anyway, uh, are there any animals in the North Pole? I guess there are polar bears who have fur. There aren't any animals with down in the North Pole, are there? Uh, you know, they, um, I have I have no idea if you know the answer to that question. You know, look, if if you think North Pole versus South Pole, North has uh, the polar bears, right. but they're they're mostly closer to Svalbard and Spitsbergen and inland mm-hmm. because they're looking for food. It it doesn't behoove them to go further out to the geographic North Pole because. Mm-hmm. There's less and less food sources, and, for them. and they don't get the personal satisfaction of reaching the North Pole. <laughs> yeah. Now, having said that, we we uh, carry rifles, and right? Yeah. We're not and flares. Sorry, we don't want to shoot them. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, in in the worst case scenario, it's not to say one can't go off off track and and be spotted closer to the pole. But really, um, they're they're more closer to land because they're looking for food source. Mm-hmm. Now, in the South Pole, you have that those emperor penguins, which are adorable. That's the one from uh, that film. What March was of the Penguins. March of the Penguins. Morgan Love Freeman, them. yeah. And so they're there in the South Pole, but really they're only kind of, I think they're closer to the Weddell Sea. So they're not really near Vincent, and they're not in the South Pole either. Mm. So I never saw a penguin. Bummer. But, but Emperor penguins, that's the only place you can find them. Yes, yes, I've heard that. Well, anyway, so feathered friends, back to the feathered friends. Yeah, I think it's good quality. And what I liked about them is, you know, they, they took kind of my measurements off me. They made sure, you know, I kept trying to say, no, 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 I need, I need you know, a large or a medium. And they were like, nope, I, I, we do this every day. You know, that's too big. You know, they put me in a smaller size. It was perfect. Um, so they really know their size, you know, their sizing, their measurements, the quality of the product. And I think um, it, the other thing is, is in your sleeping bags, you have to remember when it's cold, you need a little extra room down at the bottom to put all your electronics, um, anything that might freeze mm. that that's liquid, uh, water bottles, um, any sort of lotions, potions, mm-hmm. stuff like that. That all has to go at the bottom of the sleeping bag. So you always want to get a sleeping bag that's a little bit longer than you. So you have a, a nice little cozy place for your all your electronics and liquids. I love it. The feathered friends. My roommate and I decided last winter, Vanessa, that we just needed to get those Everest suits for our commute to work each morning. You should see <laughs> the people around Boston, as I'm sure you know, look absolutely miserable in the morning because, you know, you walk out of your apartment and it's freezing cold. It's windier. Boston, I've heard, is windier than Chicago. There's a fun fact. But you slap on one of those Everest suits and I'm sure you'll be toasty on the way to work. And everybody in Boston will absolutely hate hate you <laughs> <laughs> well they might think it's halloween like 24 hours <laughs> right but i it does get kind of cold in boston sometimes and if you get one of those everest suits i think you should be all set on your commute to work in the morning anyway the feathered friends on vanessa's meister profile page on our website mtnmeister.com thank you vanessa to close i want to talk about the greatest party in all of the outdoors industry. For our listeners, we had Phil Powers on episode number 57, and he, t- he talked about the American Alpine Club. He's the executive director, so he knows a thing or two about it. For the listeners, you can go check that out. Now, we did not, Vanessa, talk with Phil about the American Alpine Club benefit dinner, which, like I said, sounds like the best party in the land. Okay, absolutely. Like listeners need to know about this because this is accessible and it is, it's happening uh, the last Saturday in January, January 31st in New York City. Um, so tri state area people, you know, come on down. It is, uh, you can find information on the American Alpine Club.org. Right at the bottom, there's a um, 2015 dinner information tab that you can go to book tickets. Um, do do you know what they're serving for dinner yet? Uh, you know what? 
Oh, actually, I did get a list that oh. uh, the traditional one that says, "Do you want salmon, beef, or uh, a vegetarian?" But more importantly, is is who's coming and who some of these keynotes are, because uh, the primary keynote is uh, Reinhold Mesner, and your listeners will know him as uh, both the first person who climbed Everest without oxygen, as well as uh, the the person who went out and did all 14 of those 8,000 meter peaks over 26,000 feet. So there's only about uh, 35 people who've done that in the world. Um, so he is uh, amazing. He's he's coming to the dinner. He's legend. Like, you know, to dress absolute legend. But in addition, we've got Sir Christopher Bonington, who was knighted by the Queen for his services um, to mountaineering. He was one of the first up the south base of Annapurna. He's been to uh, the Himalayas over 14 times. Um, Bonington is, is almost an equal legend to um, Mesner. And then we have kind of our, our, our new up-and-coming young guns who are just doing amazing things in climbing. Uli Steck is joining us. Uli is, uh, you know, used to have that uh, amazing video with the, the speed ascent of the Eiger. Mm-hmm. Yep. And now, uh, just last year, he went and climbed Annapurna, um, which has a, a death to summit statistic of, you know, for every three that climb, one dies. What a terrible yeah. statistic. That's oh, depressing. Awful. Yeah. Awful, awful. And, you know, but he went, he got up Annapurna. It was, it was amazing. And, you know, just an incredible feat. That's a mountain that people are terrified of. But, you know, he went and soloed it. Um, and then uh, we have Ed Vister's coming. Ed Vister's is the American who's done the 14 8,000 meter peaks. There's only one American who's, who's done that. Um, so I'm just so excited about this this guest list and this turnout. That Saturday daytime from like 10 to 2, we're going to have the, those speakers all kind of say something to a, to the daytime audience. And then in the evening, you know, there'll be lots of mingling, lots of tables, lots of presentations, and it's just going to be amazing and good fun. And I, you know, I want to place a bet that we're never going to see this lineup, those people in the same room again in my lifetime. Yeah, quite the guest list. Very impressive. I hope to be in attendance as well. For the listeners, tickets are $275 for members, $350 for non-members, but that $350 includes a one-year membership, so you about draw even in price there. You can also opt in for some higher packages. Vanessa, I was thinking of splurging on one of the $12,000 VIP tables and treating some Meister fans. What do you think? Oh my God, that's a brilliant idea that's a good idea or i could ask the meister fans hey if we all want to split it we can go maybe a a thousand to 1200 each and i'll split a vip table send me an email if you'd like to get in on that vanessa wonderful having you today no thank you so much it was really good fun for the listeners check out vanessa on her meister profile page mtnmeister.com you can also find out more about her at vob online Dot com. Thank you, Vanessa. And hey, have a great rest of your year. And maybe I'll see you beginning of 2015. That sounds perfect. Thank you, Ben. There it is, everyone. The best party in climbing. The American Alpine Club benefit dinner last weekend in January. We'll have all the details on Vanessa's Meister profile page. Check that out. As many of you know, this past weekend was the New York City Marathon, which I ran and completed. I am still alive. Next episode of Mountain Meister will be yours truly, reflecting on the marathon experience. I'll be covering all sorts of topics. I'll talk about how I felt during the race physically and also what I was thinking about, especially toward the end. I'll talk about how I can't move my legs right now, how I wince every time I put any sort of pressure on them, and even how my life has changed. Until then, this is the podcast that explores the mind.